Играет за нами придет. So, uh, my name is Shima Shalom. As I told you, I was uh, born in uh, Kaunas, in Lithuania. And um, the, our family is originally from Lithuania, before the war, before the Holocaust. Uh, let's say my, I found my great-grandfather's grave in Jerusalem when he was old. Uh, he came to Jerusalem in his late years and he was buried there. And on his grave it's written in uh, Hebrew, uh, this person from Kalmas, in Hebrew, on his grave, on the stove. So probably I think that our family, at least from my mother's side, is from Kaunas originally at least uh, six or seven generations, maybe more. And um, uh, as I said, uh, before 43 years, we left Lithuania and we went to our homeland, to Israel. And I was raised there. I left Lithuania when I was 12 and a half years old, so I was very young. I, I uh, finished here five, five grades and two months more. And so I, I was raised in, in Israel, studied there, served in the, in the Israeli army, uh, studied in, uh, in um, yeshivas, rabbinical uh, colleges, and uh, worked in the Jewish education area quite a lot of, a lot of years. And about 20 years ago, I was sent by the government of Israel to serve in the Israeli embassy in Kiev as a representative of rabbinical courts of Israel. Now, it should just explain what are the rabbinical courts, right? Why, the, why, why regular courts are not, are not, in, not, not enough? So, um, the, the, the target was that uh, in Israel there are two uh, legal systems, two parallel legal systems which cooperate with each, which, uh, each, which, uh, each other. But finally, there are in, in, independent. There is a, a regular uh, uh, justice uh, system which deals with uh, crimes, you know, and, uh, financial things and everything. But everything which is connected with a, a, <coughs> a private status, which means marriages, divorces, a, a Jewishness, etc., etc., belongs only by the law in Israel to the Rabbinat side. If the, the people that are 
want to get uh, approval or to get married or to get divorced, etc., if they are Jewish. If they are Christians, they go to, to Christian court. If they are Muslims, they go to a Muslim court. Okay, this is the system. Since uh, even before State of Israel was established, even in the time of English, uh, the English <coughs> mandate in, in uh, Palestine. And our uh, state exists, uh, thanks God, only be 74 years. And this is, the, this is the law and this is the system. This, this is how it works. Now, um, when the Soviet Union crashed, thanks God, again, so uh, uh, many people uh, went to Israel to live there, made a liar, and sometimes the self-status of those people was not very clear because there were, there were uh, couples which were separated, separated a long time ago. But they didn't have a Jewish divorce, only a civil divorce. Or there were people that came to Israel and uh, they were Jewish or half, or half Jewish and they wanted, wanted to get married, but there was a question about their Jewishness. However, the uh, Israeli government decided in 1998, I think, no, even before 1996, to establish a department in every embassy of Israel in the post-Soviet territory, post-Soviet uh, area, a special department which is, was called the representative office of the rabbinical courts of Israel. This project exist, existed till uh, maybe 2006 or 2010. The uh, one here in the No, West. no. So, and, 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 and uh, these are the main purposes of, of this uh, project. So I, was, I went there uh, 20 years ago. I went, served there for uh, three years. And uh, naturally, the needs that were in this in, in this um, issues that uh, were raised, even not only in Ukraine but in Moldova or in Lithuania or Latvia or Estonia or even Finland or Poland, somehow they it came to me. And I had to move uh, in this area quite uh, quite often to to solve to solve uh, problems. <coughs> When I finished and I came back to Israel, we established, I was very, uh, I, I understood that there is some kind of, uh, some kind of um, missing, missing part of the absorption of uh, the Jews that came to Israel. And this means that people that come to Israel, they think that uh, whenever they get the citizenship, the citizenship Everything is solved. Now they have to they study, they have to make their, to solve the economical problems, etc. But we understand that the main main uh, uh, the main thing, way, the main thing to, to be really absorbed in the new community, in the new so, uh, uh, in the new uh, country, is to be able. To get married with whoever you want, for your view, for your children, etc. And in this point, there was a problem because some people brought their documents from here, or from Russia, or from Ukraine, or from other Russian-speaking countries, or, or some of them didn't didn't bring them. And whenever they came to the to the rabbinate, uh, to the rabbinate to uh, register their weddings. Uh, there, there were some documents that were missing, and there was a problem to approve their marriages or to approve their Jew Jewishness at all. Now you should you would ask very, uh, I'd, I'd say, ex expectedly you you would ask why the fact that they came to Israel is not enough, right? So uh, the, the reason is very, very simple, because I, I told you before that there are two parallel legal systems and the Ministry of Interior in Israel, by the law, by the law, 
they are not, uh, they don't guarantee that what is written in your file in the Ministry of Interior as nationality and religion is a fact, is, is real. Maybe, maybe there is a doubt about, about it. Now, the pro what's the problem? The problem is that we, all in Jewish law, and also in the, our uh, civil law, we are not allowed to, um, to make marriage, Jewish relig religious marriages and divorces, etc., to people that don't belong to the Jewish religion. Okay, it's not allowed for 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 the Abinad, for, for and also it is not allowed by the religious law. So finally, this is a question, and we established a, an organization which is called Shorashim. Shorashim is translated as roots in English, and we deal with those people who need, who need help in this, uh, in, in this issue. Mostly it is before marriage, but uh, sometimes it's other, other purposes too. Not for Aliyah, not for immigration. We can consult people, advise them, because we have a lot of experience. But still, we try to be very, very um, concentrated on the purpose of the Jewish law, Jewish religious law. Um, we have staff, it's not only me, I have five people that are specialists in, in, this, uh, in this area. It's very, uh, there are not many people in the, in the world at all that can, really, that are really able to check and to <coughs> understand the to understand every document, to make conclusions about it. And finally, we send our recommendation to the rabbinical... Finally, we send a, a recommendation to a rabbinical court in Israel, it could be in Tel Aviv, in, in Jerusalem, in Haifa, etc. And usually, I mean, about close to 100% one, of the cases, it is approved according to our recommendation. Of course, to, to, to reach such a level of work, we had to work hard, and we had to uh, uh, be in very close connections, contacts, with the uh, Jewish commun communities all over the world, and especially in the former Soviet Union. And we have to learn all the time to, to know the history of this Jewry, uh, at least in 100 or 200 years, uh, last, uh, last years. And also we have to, we must be very reliable to the rabbinical courts in Israel. And if they don't rely on us, we can retire. We, 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 will, we, will, not, we will not have what to do. So this is somehow uh, the first, uh, the first uh, explanation of our work that I would like to to uh, inform you, to, to tell you. I would like very much to have a conversation, not, a, not, a, not just a lecture. So it's up to you how, what will be done, how it will be done. Okay, yeah. <coughs> this is very interesting how these two systems work in, in a parallel way. Mm -hmm. uh, doesn't they intervene into each other's fields sometimes? Say, for example, if a man beats his wife, well, or the other way around. So on the one hand, it's a crime. On the other hand, it's like a wedding relationship. Uh, I, I don't know. It's a crime. Man, from every side, it's a crime. And then they come to to, to separate, to divorce. Mm -hmm. So you yeah. have to divorce, and the crime has to be sort of established, diagnosed. Of course, if it's if it's a, a crime, so there is a police, there is a court. Of course, it is. I mean, absolutely. I, I told you that the, those two courts, two court systems, do cooperate with each other, of course. So not quite parallel, but they, 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 they do cooperate, with of course, of course. Uh, but I, I, I'll tell you, what, what's, what's this, what is the, the main thing? That <coughs> we established our state, state of Israel, in order to get back, as, as we can, back from the diaspora, which we went to 2,000 years ago, and to stay a united nation, a united people. Now, it's a miracle that people who came from Morocco, from Yemen, 
from uh, France, from uh, Uzbekistan and from Lithuania, they do speak the same language, same ancient language, which somehow uh, came to life, to be alive in the past hundred years. And also the laws, the, the, the special, the most important laws of uh, creating a family, family connections, wedding or divorce, and are, sa are same. I mean, those communities which had no connection with each other for ages, now, when they came back together, the laws are common. I mean, there's no difference between this and this about those very most significant, most, most important laws. So this is, on, this is a, mir a miracle, I think. But the miracle can be explained. It can be explained because we have, and we have, for all these years of the astronomy, even before that, we had a very unique, a, a very a culture, a very unique um, uh, studyship, which is Torah and Talmud and Halakha, and our, uh, uh, all, all the rabbis that were through, through the ages. So all the questions that could, could be raised in all those ages were discussed. Were discussed. There were written a lot of books about it. And, and finally, the, 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 or, there always was a dialogue among those, those rabbis in the world, in the Jewish world, how to solve those problems, problems that, was, that were a, in every time the world problems. Yeah. Uh, so um, now when we came back to our land and we have a government and we are independent, of course, the people of Israel, it doesn't depend if they are religious, half-religious, or atheistic. Most of them, I'm talking about close to 90%, do, do want very much to remain a united nation, which can marry with, marry with each other, which can talk with each other, which can have a common basis of life, of cultural life, of a, a, a independent life, Jewish life. So, uh, at this, uh, fr from this uh, point of view, uh, I think that all the arguments between us among us would be the, the remain, they are, they exist, but we all the, in Israel and also abroad, but especially in Israel, people understand that there is some very, very important and heavy basis which must be common for, for, for all of us. And this is the reason why the chief rabbinate of Israel that was established a, a hundred years ago, much before the, the state of Israel, is now a, an institute which is not voluntary as in every country outside. I mean, you, if you want to do, you belong to the Jewish community. If you don't want to, you don't belong. If you want to, you make Jewish marriage. If you don't want to, do, you don't marry. You stay with the citizens. But in, the, in Israel, it's a, an institute with this, uh, belongs to the, to, to, to the government. This is the only way to register, we are talking about marriage, the only way to register marriage is through, through the rabbinate, and rabbinate and the rabbis who work there are civil workers, it's a civil government uh, institute, they get their, sal their salary not from the community, from the government, and the judges of, uh, of uh, rabbinical courts, they have the same status as the judges in the, in the civil court, no difference. This is how it goes. Okay. But very practically, say <clears throat> this legal system is based on Torah and Talmud, as you said. But if someone is an atheist and has an uh, Israeli citizenship, and he or she says, I don't want to, to have anything in common with the rabbinical court, for example. Depends on which questions. Uh, wedding? If he wants marriage. to get divorced, divorced or to get married, this is the law. You cannot escape that. By the way, I'll, I'll tell you now, probably all of you know, but in Lithuania, before the Holocaust, before the Second uh, the World, War II, World War II, all the marriages in Lithuania, or in Latvia, most of them, or not, 
This is very important. Very important. Yeah. Uh, all the marriages in, in Poland also, almost all Poland, were only by the religious law. No Jew in Lithuania could get married civilly, just as a rabbi. Mm -hmm. Even if there were atheists or whatever. whatever. So in this in this point, it's quite similar to what what was going on in uh, in Israel till now. Do you need some controversy? So is there some criticism left by say modern society in Israel? Of course. I mean, in every question there is a criticism. Mm -hmm. But we are a democ democratic state, and this is the law. And most of the most of the people in Israel accept that in order to remain a united nation and to have the ability to get married, everyone with everyone, with no suspects about what was a generation or two ago in this family. So this is, this is a system should exist. And it should, and it should be supervised by the really big rabbis who belong to the chief rabbinate of Israel. And as I said, the chief rabbinate is not a voluntary organization. It's a civil uh, governmental uh, organization which is responsible for all these questions in, uh, in Israel. Now, we, maybe it's a, a right point to compare it with the law of return, right? The law of return, the, the, the Aliyah. Yeah. The law of return, the law of repatriation to Israel. I, so again, I don't know what is the background of the people that, that uh, are present here. But uh, the law of return was established in 1950. And the law of return originally said only one thing. Every Jew has the right to become an Israeli citizen. That's all. Now, 20 year, about 20 years passed, and people, and, and politicians, and the people understood that it should be defined who is a Jew, civilly. Because by the religious law, we knew who is a Jew for 3,000 years. It was not a question. But would the civil law accept the halakhic uh, uh, definition or not? And uh, there was a question, there were, there were political debates about it. Finally, uh, all the, it, it was uh, put in, into the law, accepted by everyone, that the definition of a Jew civilly is alike the halakhic definition. Same thing. I mean that a Jew or, or a Jewish woman is, is defined as someone by minimum, can by, by minimum, that was born to a Jewish mother or made a Jew, converted to, to Judaism. This is the definition. Now, same, at the same time, if there is any question, I would like very much to hear it, and also in Lithuania. It's my problem that I can uh, speak fluently Lithuanian, that I can hear. Uh, yes, please. You know, I was at the uh, Rule Lucien, or Western Wall in Jerusalem, yes. and some rabbis, I was praying there, and some rabbis uh, that were standing a little bit aside, they asked me if I was a Jew. Well, my grandfather was a Jew, so can, uh, <laughs> I was very enjoyed that they asked me uh -huh. because I like my Jewishness, which is one fourth. Of course. And uh, I said, well, I was proud that my grandfather is a Jew from Odessa. I said, Odessa is a Jewish town, not a yeah. city. But, <laughs> but then they asked that grandmother, <laughs> she has been a hiccup because uh -huh. my grandmother is Ukrainian. So my mother thought about herself as a Jewish. Because her father. Because of the father, yeah. And is she Jewish? We discussed with her that uh, Nazis would kill me, but not her, because she is officially not Jewish. Her father is Jewish. But I would be killed because my mother is Jewish. Why, why do you think so? No, no. No. As I as I study and uh, learn the history of the Holocaust, no, they're not right. No. I'm, I mean, they are not uh, they are not authorita for us in any anything. The, the Nazis, yeah. So so we don't we don't decide make our decisions because of them. 
But, but the facts are that they had arguments inside them about who was those who were half, a Michelin it was called, and those who were only, only quarter Jewish, as you, as you said, they usually didn't touch, usually. But, uh, but it doesn't matter, okay? They were cruel, and they were, were uh, Nazis, and that's all. Yes, please. Yes. So, um, what is then the definition of a Jewish woman? The w a woman who was born to a Jewish mother. Yes. But Et cetera. But I hope um, that the, uh, uh, exactly, um, can anybody call themselves a Jewish woman? Ah, that's right. This is the question. Now we came to it. <laughs> now, what, what would be the proof to this fact? What would be the proof? You're, you're, you're absolutely right. Now, till now, we, talk, we, talk, we spoke about definitions. Very good. But what would be the proof? Now, at least 1,900 years, it was not such a good deal to be a Jew. Okay. So no one was afraid that someone will come and tell you he's a Jew if he's not. Okay. Almost not, no one lied like this, because it was not a good business to be a Jew. But, since our uh, state was established, not, not at the beginning. At the beginning, when the law of return was, was uh, accepted, also people didn't think that someone who is not a Jew will come and tell he's a Jew, because there were so many problems, terrorism and wars and economical uh, crisis and everything. So, so people knew, understood that only someone who is really a real Jew will come to this country, uh, country with desert and, and, and uh, etc. But, thanks a lot, now our country is uh, economically very good, comparatively even to Europe countries, and uh, we have a strong army, and we have uh, many good things to offer. So, uh, people now, some people, some of them, do have an interest to be, to be recognized as Jews. So the, the thing is, and now we got into the really the, the, the halakha, the Jewish law. It's uh, very interesting because basically, basically someone was a, a family, let's say, a family, who was uh, which was part of the Jewish community during gen during gen generations all the time. They are not su suspected to be non-Jews who kept themselves in, inside the, the community. Okay? So from the West, from America and, and South America and South Africa and uh, Western Europe, how do, the, how do people come to Israel usually? They get a, a recognition, they get the, 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 the paper from a, a community member who knows the family for many, many years. He explains the history of his family, and uh, the Sukhnut takes this paper, passes it to the Minister of the Interior, and the people and the people are accepted in Israel and get the citizenship. Where is the problem? The problem is the Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union. Because uh, one of the big, big crimes of the Soviet regimes, regime was that the Soviet regime, besides all the cruel things they done, they done, the Soviet regime uh, destroyed totally Jewish communities. Now, a Jewish person cannot live without a community because he needs Jewish education, he needs to, 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 to learn, to study, to, to teach the young, uh, young children, he needs to uh, a special kosher food, he needs to get married as a Jew, he needs to get buried as a Jew, etc. etc. If there is no community, theoretically a person cannot, cannot stay a Jew at all. But there was a miracle that the Creator made, that in the Soviet Union, during three or four generations, people stayed, remained a Jew. They remained with a more or less Jewish identification without any support of the community. 
It's a real historical miracle. We, 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 we wouldn't expect that such a thing to happen. And when the Soviet Union crashed, we saw that there are some people, some Jewish families, completely Jewish families that come to Israel, some of them stay here, okay? Some of them are mixed. One generation, two generations, or two generations, or, or three even. So uh, the return of the law, besides the definition of a Jew, there is another paragraph there that says that even uh, someone who is part of a Jewish family, which means uh, siblings, uh, I mean uh, wife or husband, uh, child of a Jew, or a, a grandson or grand granddaughter of a Jew, also have the right to come and get the citizenship of Israel uh, as every Jew. Same, same rights. But without being a Jew, uh, not without being, being a Jew <laughs> themselves, that's right. Uh, till third generation, but uh, but it doesn't say that this person is recognized as a Jew. It's written in the Minister of the Interior in his file. It's written. He came to Israel as as a son, as a, a grandson of a Jew, but he's not him himself privately is not a Jew. And he really, as he, as he, in this position, in this situation, this person cannot get married in Israel in a rabbinate. Because he's not a Jew. So there is a law, quite a new law, about 10 years, that if there are two citizens in Israel without a religion, they don't belong to any, to, don't belong to any religion. There is such a thing, because people who came from former Soviet Union, they are not... Uh, so they are not Jews. Yeah. Not Jew, not Jews, of course, not Jews, but also not Christians, not Muslims, not but citizens of Israel. But citizens of Israel. So if both of them are like this, non don't they don't belong to any religion? They have the right to uh, officially um, officially register themselves as a couple, as a family couple. Let's say this kind of definition. It's not defined as marriage, but it's defined like a couple, a couple which like one family. Not uh, many people do that. Most of them go abroad to Cyprus or to Lithuania or to Prague or some other place to register in Mary or in similarly register their relationship. Uh, but, but there is a possibility for a couple who are both non-Jewish in Israel. This is a new law. I don't think it's very realistic, but it does exist. Uh, there is another, other examples. We, we deal in our office, we deal since, uh, and during the last 17 years, we deal with thousands of families which needed our, our help. So I'll tell you one story. It's not, it's not a, I mean, there are not many stories like this, but still, it's a story that, that can, can, can show something that we are talking about right now. Uh, a sad story, I'd say. Uh, woman came to Israel from Ukraine, okay, with her mother, Jewish woman. Now she met in Israel an Arab guy, and she fell in love with him, and she wanted to get married to him. In order to get married to him, she converted to Islam. Otherwise, she married. She cannot get married. She converted to Islam, and they had one child together. And then this man murdered her, very cruelly. <coughs> so the child, he was, uh, they, they found him and they put him in jail. And the child was, uh, was raised by his grandmother, the mother of the Jewish woman. But the child is registered in the Ministry of Interior as a Muslim. Because he was born to a Muslim couple, right? Officially. Now, by the Jewish law, Jewish spiritual religious law, of course the child is Jewish. No doubt to it. Even if the mother converted to, to Islam, it doesn't so that it's doesn't nothing. count if you convert. It's nothing. A Jew cannot, cannot uh, leave or cannot uh, uh, go out from this Jewishness. The same as uh, Jews were baptized in Spain. That's right. Mm -hmm. If we would know today about someone who was 
if you would be sure that someone is by his maternal line, even 20 generations ago, was baptized, and by the maternal line we know that he is the son or daughter of this line, he would be Jewish. We cannot be sure. More than three or four generations, you cannot uh, make uh, such a research. But but if you we would be, he remains Jewish. Now, in this uh, story, so the, the grandmother wanted to officially register her her uh, grandson as a Jew. She raised him, and he's a Jew, and he lives in, is in a Jewish uh, Israeli school. So there was a now, what was the question? The first question was that we had to prove that this woman, murdered woman, really was a Jew. By documents, because no one ever checked it in the rabbinate system. Only when she came to Israel, in the civil system, but not in the So I checked it, we, our staff we checked it, she was a Jew. So there was an idea, the guy was then 15 years old, the boy. So there was an idea to to make kind of a conversion or half conversion for him to register him as a Jew. But was, what was the problem? The problem was that he, because he was a teenager, his father that was put in jail had to agree. <laughs> Otherwise, locally, there's no, no way to, to, to take him back to Judaism. So I told him, look, we have three more years, let's wait. It's just a technical thing. Let's wait two more years, we don't ask this Muslim who is in jail to, for permission, and then the, the boy will, be, will do what he wants, whatever he wants. Now this example shows us that, that the fact to which we usually belong in Israel is quite an, an important fact. fact. Okay? Maybe. Yeah? Uh, I wanted to ask you, do rabbis also serve in the Israeli army? And if they do, do they have to complete basic training? Uh, Sorry? Yeah, I'm listening. Mm -hmm. uh, do they also have to complete basic training, uh, even if their religion doesn't uh, allow them to take uh, weapons? Okay, it, it, that, it, it is not connected to our issue, but I will answer, okay? Mm -hmm. So I served in the army for three years. Mm -hmm. I had no problem with my uh, religious uh, no ideology. Mm -hmm. Opposite. I, I, I don't think it's, it's uh, my obligation to serve the army and to keep all the obligations of Torah. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't, I don't, uh, never heard of some kind of requirement for a religious person to hold the weapon. Mm -hmm. If you good, if you do good things with this weapon, it's, it's very good. Mm -hmm. Uh, many of the religious people do serve in the army, they do complete their uh, service. Uh, many people that uh, cho choose to delay their army because they want to learn to run, they are allowed to learn to run to run. Uh, thanks God, there are many, many people like this, and it's okay by the law and it's permitted by, by the state. This, this uh, rabbinical court somehow deal or no or register those couples who say they are Muslims, uh, who are Arabs, uh, uh, exercising Israeli citizenship. Say Arabs. No, Rabbinical courts don't have any, don't have any position or status to deal with people who are not Jewish by the religious law. So the, those who are Muslims say belong to the Muslim Muslim court, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and there they are. Uh, I mean, it's very easy. A very easy thing to convert to Islam, you know. It's a few words that the person should uh, say and, and to accept some obligations. Not very difficult to become Jew. It's quite a hard thing, quite a tough thing. I mean, if a person is wants to do it, okay, it's it's possible, of course. But but uh, it takes time, learning. Knowing who, who, in what we believe, in which which uh, basic we believe, and what we want, uh, how how to keep all the mitzvot, all the obligations that the Torah says that a Jew a Jew should keep, and then if someone is really uh, wants it, really 
understands what 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 uh, responsibility did he takes uh, upon himself. Okay, it's it's uh, it is possible. So if you are in Islam and have four wives, what then to do with this? In Israel, wives? it's it's not it's not allowed by law to have one more than one one wife. Before the establishment of the state, maybe it was, but in Israel it's not, it is not allowed, even for Muslims. It is not real Islam. Oh, so there are some that make, uh, especially Bedouins, that make uh, 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 fictive divorce and take another wife. So there are cases like this, but uh, but um, it, it is not a lot. The Gamia is not permitted. Huh? The former wife remains somewhere around in the household, right? Yes, of course, it is with both. But it is not allowed by the law to have two wives. Mm -hmm. So so that is the solution to it. Legal. Yeah. Yeah. And how many years must one study to become a rabbi? It depends. How many how strong he is in his studying, how clever he is, how 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 uh, uh, this is it's not it's not only knowledge I mean, to, to, to become someone who is a Torita for other people in Jewish in Judaism person should be very very in a very very high spiritual level so it depends mm -hmm. some people do it not all of them do it but some rabbis became rabbis at uh, uh, for when they were four, 40 years old someone 20 years old it depends on the person and also, ah, it, 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 very, very important to say, a rabbi is not a degree, okay? Because after he, uh, once someone uh, becomes a rabbi, as you said, he mm -hmm. proceeds studying, of course, yeah. <coughs> teaching other people and studying himself. Okay. Um, I, I think there were, were some few a uh, few more issues that I was was asked to talk about. Um, Actually, Jenna, I actually don't know if it's true. Casta is in court with Alta. Chosen people. What is chosen people? Yeah, actually, uh, these were my, my questions. Uh -huh. Because everything you've told now relates to like the legal system like to, to getting another citizenship and that sounds very pretty formalistic and mm. you just have to solve various issues issues come on this thing or not uh, and, and, and get your decision solutions etc but uh, since i get this asking you said me that you're going to talk about Jewishness, what makes it that. So I was having in mind something wider than just legal definition of being a Jew. Maybe I was uh, uh, thinking about barriers of identity and attitude toward, toward other nations, toward other religions, uh, okay. also, which is very, uh, which is very vividly discussed in the world. Actually, of course, recently uh, I happened to open pr uh, prayer book in, in Warsaw in synagogue, and somehow, <coughs> accidentally, the first sentence I fell upon it was, "Thank God I was not born a gentile." That's right. Yes. Yeah. So <laughs> every every, every Muslim. Yeah. So uh, this that presupposes something like being superior, being chosen. Uh, this this bearing of Jewish identity presuppose that state of mind, uh, which is uh, which yeah. other people uh, blame Jews okay. have uh, okay. blame Jews as, as, as practicing. Okay, maybe we'll let Rabbi Baron to answer. Okay. His his knowledge is my, my, much more than mine, and his English is absolutely better. So <laughs> in this in this issue, maybe you the second part I'll I'll, I'll, uh, I'll agree with. You. <laughs> My first language. I speak a lot of languages, but the first language is English. I'll, I'll come this way, not to make people have difficulty. It, it, it's, it's true that it's related. This question is related. Of course. But it's perhaps it's a background question. 
to the whole issue mm -hmm. of, of, of uh, who is a Jew and how do you prove Jew Jewishness. So I, I think that I, I do have a, a, if you'll follow my, my reasoning, if you'll follow my, my explanation, then you'll have a very complete answer. But I ask that you, that you work with me on this, and it's, it's comprehensive, but it's, it's, it's accurate, and it's completely different than what anybody thinks. In other words, anybody who comes to, the, to, to, the, to this question, the way that you came to the question, which is the regular way that a person would come from Western culture to this question, would have it as a question. The truth is that it's not a question at all, but for that you have to come from it from a different angle. So the first thing is, what does it mean that we're chosen? Who were we chosen by? Why were we chosen? And what are we chosen? What is chosen about us, right? So for a person who, who's unaware of what the words mean, you have chosen us, it sounds like, wow, you know, I won the lottery and you didn't, right? This is it. I have something that you don't have. But if you don't know what that thing is, then who says you want that thing? Like, if you say, I was chosen to win the lottery, I just won 12 million euro, so that sounds good, right? I just, I was chosen. But if you say, I was just chosen to do jury duty and have to be on duty for the next six years, to come to court every day at 8 o'clock in the morning, then maybe it's not so great to be chosen, right? But people are chosen also in that way to get jury, have jury duty here. You know, you know what it is, jury duty? In America, we have a jury. They have here jury duty. You know what I mean? How, how do you, but you can explain what it is to those people that don't un understand what it is. You understand what it is? So you're chosen, you're right? You won the jur jury duty. It's not, it's not so much fun to get jury duty. The Jewish people, first of all, first of all, the Jewish people were chosen by God. So if you don't believe in God, for example, then there's nothing, there's no choice. There was no chosen, right? Let's say a person, if you don't believe in God, or you don't agree that God did the choosing, then this question is over. We're never chosen, so there's no problem. So the, the first basis is to believe in God, and the second basis is to believe that God made a choice and that he chose the Jewish people. Now, that's number one. So first of all, we're chosen, chosen by God. Second of all, why were we chosen? Before I say what we were chosen to do, okay? What we were chosen to be. Why were we chosen? So here you go a little bit into more depth in the Jewish sources. It's not, you know, this is, this is something that's not on the surface readily available in, in, in the sources. We were chosen for a reason. It's not actually, to be precise, we were chosen. It was Abraham and Isaac and Jacob were chosen, to be precise. In other words, it's not me. I wasn't chosen. God chose Abraham and then his son Isaac and his son Jacob and their wives and children to, for a reason. So they were chosen because God, if you, again, this is all on the basis that you believe in God. So if you believe in God, then God created the world for a reason. He created people for a reason. He created humanity for a reason. He created the world for a reason. Otherwise, there's no, I mean, what's the point of a God who's not connected, has nothing to do with the universe and with humanity? So again, this is on the understanding. The first given is that there's a God. He created the world for a reason. He created humanity for a reason. Now, if he created for humanity for a reason, there's something that humanity has to accomplish. Humanity has to accomplish something. So we have to understand what humanity has accomplished. So, here goes. Jewish people were chosen to do the job that God created humanity for. And God created humanity for to have His, God's godliness, glory, kingship of the universe known to the entire world. So in other words, God created the world not that nobody should know who he is, because God is not seen in the world. Nobody's, you know, seen him. I mean, obviously, we believe that the prophets somehow talked to him, communicated with him. He came down on Mount Sinai and talked to the Jewish people. But other than that, God's not here. He's, however, when you call it, he's there. But again, God created the world. He created for a purpose, and he created humanity for a purpose. The purpose is, and here is the issue that you have to believe, in order to believe the next sentence that the Jews are the chosen people. God created humanity to bring out 
the reality of his creation and glory. And the Jews were chosen to do that task. And they were chosen because Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob did exactly that. Abraham himself was three years old. He was in an idol-worshipping society. And he, on his own volition, chose to find God and to spread the word of God. And therefore, God said, okay, here it is. I'm waiting for this person, so to speak. And then God chose Abraham. His son Isaac continued in the same fashion. His son Ishmael did not continue in that same way. Isaac, again, had, had, uh, had the sons. His son Esau did not continue in that fashion. But his son Jacob did. And Jacob, again, was chosen. This lineage was chosen from then on for the children to spread the word. In order to spread the word, they, unfortunately, at the beginning, had to suffer in Egypt for 400 years. When they came out of Egypt, God spoke to them on Mount Sinai and said, here it is, here is the message. This is the message you should spread. So I, it, it's a long story, but it's not that long. This, this is it. So when you say the chosen people, we were chosen to give the message of God to the rest of humanity. So it's not like, it's not like we're chosen to, to get to win the 12 million euro lottery. We're chosen that we have a, a, a job, we have a purpose, we have a, a burden even, I would say. In other words, we have a responsibility, which is the main word, to spread the word of God. So that is the background to why the Jewish people were chosen and what they were chosen to do. So again, it's on the basis that there's a God. He created the world and humanity for a reason. The reason is to spread this, this word. The Jewish people were chosen to be the ones to spread the word. Now, regardless of anything you believe in religiously, this is, happens to be the historical situation. That the Jewish people did, from then on, begin to spread the word of God in the form of the Torah. It was spread so that, obviously, the major religions of the world basically adopted it. Perhaps they added a little bit, took off a little bit, but the major ideas of the Jewish faith did spread and have spread over the vast majority of the, of, of the earth, of humanity. So this, this fits in. What I'm saying is thousands of years old, but it fits into what actually happens. What it means for today, and what has to do with what, what Rabbi uh, Arshalom is talking about, is that when you have a place like the Soviet Union, that perhaps generations of people are cut off from their source and the continuation, so they may have forgotten what the purpose is, what it is to be chosen, and what they were chosen for. But as Rabbi Shalom said, they don't become un-Jews because of it. Because that is a legal system. They remain Jews, even though they perhaps lost, they don't remember anymore what it is to be Jews. They don't remember why they're Jews. They don't remember what they're supposed to do. But it doesn't change the fact that they're Jews. So we, as people who have, I was lucky to grow up, that my father was, was a rabbi, Lithuanian, of course. My grandfather was a rabbi, Lithuanian, of course. So I grew up into this, so I understand from a young age what it is to be Jewish, why we're Jewish, what it is. And, and to answer your question about the blessing, it's, 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 it only comes from a Western view that you have a question of. It sounds like an arrogance, a racist name, I didn't make the agenda. You know what that means? You know what, you know what the actual literal translation of, of that blessing is? Mm -hmm. I'm happy that I have 613 responsibilities to do as a Jew and not only six as a non-Jew. That's what it means. No, because no, the progression, not. the progression of the, of, the, of the blessings are, he did not make me a Gentile, he did not make me a servant, he did not make me a woman. And a woman says, it, uh, says it, uh, something different, she says it made me as it is. The, the reason is because a non-Jew has only six commandments, six responsibilities, a, 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 a servant has... Seven. seven. No. Seven. 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 Sorry, seven. I just said six for another reason. I was uh, talking yeah. about the... It says a, 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 a non-Jew, according to Jewish law. I'm only talking about the Jewish perspective. A non-Jew from the Jewish law has seven uh, mitzvot, seven commandments. Some of them are a little wider, because like, like to, 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 to deal honestly between man and man encompasses more than just one... Uh, than just one commandment, right? So some of them are a little wider. It's not exactly seven, but it's basically called seven. The vast majority of what Jews have, non-Jews are not obligated to do. And a servant does not have all of them because he's a servant. He doesn't, he can't do, he's not able to do everything. 
and, uh, 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 and therefore a male Jew has the maximum responsibility possible. So it's not, it's the, 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 the normal attitude that you look at this, you think of it as a chauvinism, it's actually a burden. It means you're thanking God that you have the maximum possibility and the maximum responsibility. That's it. Now, as Rabbi Shalom says, you can't go the other direction. You can't, when a person is once a Jew or a mother was a Jew, they can't undo what was done a long time ago, whether it was by conversion 200 years ago or by birth 3,000 years ago. A person can't undo it, right? But they definitely don't want to join it unless they really want to take on this, this, this huge responsibility. And in the Jewish sources, if a person comes to to Rabbi Arshala mentioned that it's, it's not easy to convert. And the, the job of the rabbis, in the case of the rabbinical court, when a, when a person comes to convert, is to tell them, what do you need it for? You can be a good person. My, I've heard my father say it so many times, you can be a good person, why do you want to be Jewish? It's so, such a burden, it's such a responsibility, and it's difficult to do it. And there's so many details, and, and if you mess it up, it's no good. Just be a good person and stay, why do you have to be Jewish for? So, the, you understand how I turned everything upside down? <laughs> okay, so thank you for giving me the opportunity because it wasn't a, a one-liner for the, uh, the answer wasn't a one-liner. <laughs> I just uh, also would like maybe to add or maybe Gamzad to ask too. Uh, that you said that uh, atheists, non-believers, for them this question is simply an empty question. It is it only right. Question. Yeah. But maybe the same is for other believers of other religions. Also, right. For, say, for those who live in India, who, right, who, who, who live, Correct. Who practice India, Correct. and they hear just about Jews being chosen, but children. Yeah, born. exactly. Yeah, so... Okay. It's, a, it's, an eternal, it's an eternal thing. It's an eternal responsibility, and that's what it means. And you know, it, It's a simple mistake if anybody thinks anything else. It's simply not understanding the literal source. I'm not giving an answer because maybe some of you are Jewish or not Jewish. Or this is the real translation. Simple that simply the people don't don't know. They don't know what it means. We're chosen to carry the, the, the responsibility of spreading the word of God to the to the to the to humanity. So would you agree that more education is needed for, for the rest of the world, so to say, apart from the Jewish society? That, that aren't because sometimes it inspires anti-Semitism, inspires negative psychological actions. What I have chosen for you a better or what? Right, right. Do you really one million dollars? You are the like Jewish mafia right. yeah. helping each other, not You know what my answer to you is? You know what, you know what my my answer to you is? You obviously you can't you can't you can't go and educate the world in that fashion. It's not possible. But I can tell you that not 99% of the, of the time, the, 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 the animosity is against people who are themselves ignorant in Judaism. There's still, unfortunately, a majority of Jews, and especially with upheavals of the last century, that are not connected to Judaism. Jews that are Jewish by birth, by lineage, but unconnected, disconnected because of the destruction of the communities over the last 100 years. So th many of them go around, I mean, people in, 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 in Vilna talk to me in this fashion, that the only thing of anything about Jew is that, is that, is that I get der derisive comments from non-Jews. Otherwise, I have no idea what's Jewish about me. I mean, the people tell me this. Mm -hmm. So it, it, the, the, the responsibility for the education is not to the non-Jewish 8 billion people in the world. The responsibility of education is to those Jews that didn't, were not, that didn't have the opportunity to be aware of their heritage, but because when a Jew acts in the correct way that he's supposed to, that the Torah indicates, in, in almost all cases, he does not cause an anti-Semitism, he causes an appreciation. Because when a person behaves in the correct way, the way he's supposed to uh, 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 behave, both in his relations between man and man, and his relations between man and God. So in, in, the, in most cases, he's sanctifying God's name. And that's what it's meant to do. And that was the idea of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That they were spreading God's name, not because they were proselytizing, converting. That wasn't what was going on. They were simply behaving correctly in such a way that people said, I, I want to know what you believe in because I think that's the right thing. I think you're in the right, I think you're in the right direction. I think you've, you've, hit, the, you've hit the correct way of, 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 of acting as a human. So if, if more Jews would understand what Judaism really is, it would, from my view and from the view, I'm not only saying my view, this is historically uh, 
what the many people have written in essays about this, uh, this factor. As a matter of fact, the famous rabbi, Rabbi Berlin, the Nitziv, wrote a very big essay about anti-Semitism in the turn of the uh, 20th century, about 1890 he wrote it. And uh, he was in Volozhin in uh, Belarus, and his son was a rabbi of Moscow, and he was here, he was all, it was around. And he basically, and many others, put forward the same thing. When Jews act the right way the Jews are, are supposed to act, not try to act like non-Jews, but then be better than the non-Jews. That's not what a Jew is supposed to do. It's not his point. His point is to act correctly so that he's chosen to behave, to have a burden, a responsibility of acting correctly, and then the non-Jews say, oh, now I understand what it is to be Jews. In this area, in all this, until the Holocaust aside, almost in every place, there was a tremendous respect of the non-Jewish population for the local rabbi. In many, many cases, in many, many towns and cities, the non-Jews preferred to go, if they had a difference of opinion, they would go to the Jewish rabbi to, to educate their, their, their differences better than the civil court. There were multiple, multiple cases of that. Because they knew that by the, by the rabbi, they'll get an honest and, and, and straightforward and that you couldn't bribe him. You know, because that, if a person's acting in the correct way, the way that the Torah says, so then, uh, then it is. But you, you, we're going to educate what we're going to, you know, want to educate. The, there are people that want to do it. I had a guy on the plane, a person has a business here in Lithuania, and he wants to do, do work on this in Eastern Europe. Build up the, 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 the Jewish image and against anti-Semitism and anti-Israel. But it's not, uh, <laughs> you're not going to undo a thousand years of difficulty in Europe with, with a little bit of education, I'm sorry to say. I, I would rather spend the time on education, on educating Jews how to, how, to, how to behave correctly as Jews. Well, it concerns educating Jews. And if I'm not mistaken, that behaving correctly as a Jew is also undergoing kind of discussion and controversy sometimes in between the Jews. I'm having in mind various trends of Judaism. Well, let's say, look, What's it's always, a, they, you know, time, time, goes on, time goes on, but, uh, you know, as time goes on, obviously, things change, but uh, you, you're, if you're talking about new forms of Judaism, new expressions like conservative and reform, mm -hmm. it's already long enough that we know that they don't have, they don't last, so it doesn't make a difference. I mean, here in Lithuania, there was never any reform Judaism. There was never any reform yeah, Judaism. But in between Orthodox also, there are maybe... So there's different movements, but uh, it, they're so similar. I mean, if they dress different or this, it, it's so similar. The, the differences are minute. I mean, was it a person wearing this kind of hat or this kind of... Uh, it's, it's minute. The truth is, at the core, because, and that's what Rabbi Hashalom started to explain, at the core, the basic ideas, he explained that even people who came from the whole world from all different places, in the end, marriage, divorce, and all kinds of things are exactly the same. You have to remember that everybody has the same Torah scroll. You know what that means? For thousands of years, people were, were separated by thousands of miles and never, no communication, Jews in Yemen and, and, in, and in Lithuania, and, and, and they came back together, they have the same, the same Torah scroll with the same words on it. It's not, it's not, uh, you can always, you can always talk a lot about the, about the differences, but, <laughs> The bottom line, the, the differences are so minute compared, compared to the same. The truth, conservative is an issue because in America, conservative uh, Judaism does not necessarily, you're not required to believe that the, that the law, that the Torah was given by God in Mount Sinai. And that's a big difference. It's a type of reform. And reform is general as their own laws. They make them up as they go along, I'm sorry to say. So it's something else. But we already, I just want to tell you, you're gonna, you, you sit here in Lithuania and talk about reform. I can tell you just a simple case story at when the the hundred year anniversary of temple emmanuel in in new york it was the first reformed temple in new york a while ago already this story happened a long time ago 30 years ago or 40 years ago so it was a hundredth anniversary the centenary of the reform temple so they wanted they made a big uh, celebration and for the celebration they were looking for descendants of the founders of the temple they didn't find one jew not one jew in a hundred years so, you know, what's the point of, of movements that don't have... We, we, we're around for three, three and a half thousand years. I mean, we, we expect to be around. So what's the point of a movement that's going to last 50 years or 100 years? It doesn't... Uh, they close now, reform closed their seminar. They have only one seminar. They just closed it a few weeks ago. It's open 147 years in Cincinnati. They just closed the seminar. So that's it, they have one. And we have 
uh, the Orthodox have a seminary opening every day, a new one. There's 10,000 seminaries. I bet you, it must be 10,000. Just in Lakewood, New Jersey, there's about 2,000. I bet it's, 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 it's oh, every day opening another, another seminary. So, 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 you know, uh, where, where, where are we and where are the other movements? I'm sorry. If you find the chauvinism in that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you a historical, uh, historical fact, you know. So I wouldn't call that other movements. It's not the Judaism that's changing. It's people who are removing themselves from historical Judaism. You understand the difference? Yeah. A person wants to do it, let them do it. They can do whatever they want. You know, I mean, it's a free world. It's not like 300 years ago where you had to uh, do what everybody else did, otherwise you went to jail, right? So if they do it, they do it. But uh, as far as I'm concerned, it's not Judaism. It's something else. Okay, you made something new. Fine, go, you know, enjoy it. If it works for you, if it works for you, it works for you. But, but what we're talking about lasts. This is something that's lasted. That what Rabbi Arshalom is doing is he's trying to undo the damage of, 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 of 80 years of, of, of communism. Right? That destruction of, 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 of the attempted destruction of the Jewish people in this part of the world, that's, that's a big thing. And he's trying to, to find the people and bring them home, you know? And uh, to add to his, uh, what he called miracle, of course it's a miracle preserving Jewishness during the Soviet year, or 80 years or 50 years of Soviet rule. Actually, mm, there were cases, and it's even uh, described in various articles uh, and so on and so on, how the Jewish identity was undermined by, by it was anti-Semitism practiced after the Second World War, and Jews were afraid to, to show, show, sort of Absolutely. show off uh, signs of being Jewish, changing family names, etc., etc. And, and the Soviets did succeed in, in, in that work so much that they forgot the roots at all, and when Perestroik and Gorbachev times uh, began, they started looking for some spiritual spiritual life. Now, you now, now answer, they are you answer, Rabbi Arshalom. And Arshalom said you can explain the miracle. You know what? You know what? You know what the miracle? How God did the miracle? The, the non-Jews didn't forget, and they reminded the Jews, the Jid, over and over that he's a Jid. And that's the, that was the miracle. In a way, yeah, because if the non-Jew would have accepted the Jew after the Jew forgot his, his, his history and his heritage of the culture, then they would have been integrated, and that would have been the end. That's true, but there were various different cases also. Some did succeed to forget everything, but they, they were longing for some spiritual life, and they forgot the Jewish, about Jewishness so much that they went and got baptized thinking that, well, getting well, back to religion is the same thing. It's the same thing. Mm -hmm. And only a few years after, the, the, the news came up to, to them that Jewishness is something different, different than the Christianity. Yeah, yeah. You know, so, so uh, in a way, uh, not everybody got baptized yeah. and, and even returned to some kind of spiritual life, but, but the damage some that was, was quite great. Many hundreds, of, many hundreds of thousands of Soviet Jews chose to go to Germany yeah. instead of going to Israel. And the vast majority of those Jews are continuing the assimilation process be, began by Lenin and Stalin. That's a this historical, okay. historical fact. I have a very Thank strange you. question. Strange. What it is, can you comment, what it is the place of Kabbalah in Judaism at all? Because, you know, I'm I'm IT guy. And somehow, I, somewhere I read that there are some big, let's say, uh, how to say, ex experts of the Kabbalah and said, maybe the time has come when the human beings are ready to understand what about Kabbalah is dealing. No. Ma'am. <laughs> I study Kabbalah. It's, 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 it's not what people, th people think. They're, they're simply, it's just, it's, it's just not what people think. People uh, understand Kabbalah as, a, as a Jewish mysticism, and they understand mysticism as in the terms of some, I don't know what you would say, how do you say in Lithuanian, some medieval druid that's mixing potions and putting spells on people, that's how they somehow understand mysticism. 
Now, the just like the chosen people was correct as a statement, but incorrect in the understanding of what it is, it's the same thing as the understanding of Kabbalah. Kabbalah, Kabbalah is mysticism, but not in the way that people think it is. Kabbalah is the study of godliness in this world. That's what it is. It's an it's a advanced study in detail of how God connects to the world, how he created the world, what are the, the, the realms or levels of godliness, how, how God connects to the world in the way of, of prayer, what is the connection between a human being and God, how, how they're able to, to connect, what about a person is godly, if anything. That is the study of, of, of Kabbalah. It's, it's, a type, it's a type of study. It's the reason that it remains mystic is for two reasons. First of all, for, for a, a long time after uh, the, the, the Torah was given at Mount Sinai, it remained the realm of very few people. For thousands of years, it was a hidden study that was not, uh, that was not, uh, that was not disseminated among the, the wide public. And also, since the study of, of godliness let's put it this way, the frailty of humanity is that when a person begins to think in terms, in abstract terms, of things that are not tangible, a person tends to at least a little bit lose touch with reality, with physical reality. If a person begins to deal with the metaphysical, they somehow lose touch with the physical. And therefore, it is felt that it's not, a, it, it, it's not a good idea for a wider public to be busy with the study of Kabbalah unless the person is already has, in a situation whereby uh, uh, it will fit in to the person's psyche. I'll just give you an example. I'll give you an example. And this example, it, it's not great, but I'm going to give you an example so that to try to grasp what I'm saying, okay? We, we, have, we know there's such a thing as prophecy, right? It's mentioned in the, in, the, in the Torah, there's prophecy. In the prophets, there's prophecy. Other nations also have stories with prophets. Kabbalah is not prophecy. That's not what I'm coming to say. But prophecy means that on some level, God connects to a human being, right? He's speaking to a human being. Now, a person, I'll just give you, when I say in my, in my class, when I try to teach about this subject, I say, if a person is walking in the street, I say, my name is Elchanan. A person is walking in the street, walking in the street, and you also say, Elchanan. You turn around. You look, right, to who it is. You look around. There's no one there, right? No one there. There's no, one, no one's looking at you. So you continue walking. You imagined it. The second time, you hear Elchanan. Once. I heard it for sure. For sure. Right? Like this. What is, happens in a person's mind after the second time, he doesn't find anyone there. Imagine a third time. Imagine a fourth time. What's, go what's happening to the person? What's going on in a person in a psychological state? You following me? Psychological state, the person's beginning to get nervous, right? I'm hearing things. I'm hearing voices. Someone's, there's no one talking to me. I'm imagining things. My, my, right? That is very disturbing for a person. It's very disturbing. In order to prepare for prophecy, there's a prophetic state that a person has to be in so that he can remain a normal functioning human and speak to God at the same time. In the Torah, it talks about Bilam, the prophet, the non-Jewish prophet Bilam. And Bilam said about himself that when he got prophecy, he was noifel ugluyenai. He fell down. When, he, when, he, when, when the Spirit of God came to him, he fell on the floor, but he was, his eyes were open. What he was trying to say was that his ability to remain a regular human being was limited to the fact that he was able to open his eyes. Because a normal person, when he got the prophecy, his entire humanity was gone. He could not function as a human being during that time. Because there was, he was, let's call it, possessed by a, by a godly spirit. So he was saying about himself that I'm great because I'm blue and I'm able to keep my eyes open and see while I'm speaking, I'm having the Spirit of God speak to me. 
what, what I'm, I'm trying to take from this is that dealing with metaphysical things is, 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 is not for everybody. So in the Jewish tradition, okay, in the real Jewish tradition of study of Kabbalah, it's meant to be for a person after they've already mastered the standard study of halacha. There are certain even technical rules for this, but let's leave the technical technicality out. The person is supposed to have reached a level of absorbing the, the Torah, which is God's word and God's law that he gave to man. At a certain level, where a person has absorbed that dimension, then he's able to take in an added dimension of the study and learn and, and study in with an added dimension. For me, for example, I didn't begin at all to study till I was about, I only began the first beginning when I was about 35 or 40, 35, after I'd studied 20, over 20 years, Torah and Talmud. I didn't do anything, nothing to do with the Kabbalah. And then when I began to study, I began to understand this extra dimension. And I began to understand that everything I had studied has an added facet to it, an added level of understanding. But if a person will start to do the, the, the Kabbalah before they do, it'll be a technical study without the proper, even, even, if, even if they'll remain sane enough to do it and, and not start seeing things and hearing things because there's weird, weird things for a human being in Kabbalah. The ideas are not, they're all abstract. The entire Kabbalah is abstract ideas. Nothing is, there's no physical ideas there. Uh, it's God's software. God's software, call it that way. All, there's no, it's all abstract, but software has, has code. There's no, this is, there's no, you know, software has code and it has a hardware machine that you pl play it into. This is, uh, this is, even if you have code, there's no machine. There's nothing that runs on this software, right? It's fully abstract from beginning to end. We are machines. So, okay, well, we're yeah. the machines, you're right. We are right, you are not. You're 100% right. You're not. You're 100% right. No, you're right. So I see that uh, people who study Kabbalah after they properly studied, mastered the Talmud and mastered halacha. Not all of it, you don't have to know everything, but mastered the, 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 master the, the depth of it. And then they add to that Kabbalah and they become richer and they have an, an added dimension to understand things. They have an added dimension. But uh, people who I've seen who begin to study Kabbalah without, uh, without having first uh, grounding, you know, they're, they're just they're flying off to completely not... Just, <laughs> But it's a waste of time, and they're not, they're just, they're, they're not, um, I mean, there's an actual danger. There's actually a psychological danger. If a person's going to take it seriously and start flying the places where, the abstract places where, mentioned where, where Kabbalah talks about, then you, 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 you can lose touch with reality, you can turn night into day and do, make violence a good thing, you could turn everything upside down. It's not meant for... for what, what are the historical, let's say, rules? Is there any, anything clear? When, when Kabbalah was written or somehow arised? We know that Kabbalah was to give it together. There, there's, the law, there's law together with the Torah at Sinai. It was an oral law. And all of the Kabbalah was given as an oral law. Now, having said that, Rabbi uh, Shimon, uh, the son of Yochai, who lived 2,000 years ago, he received certain revelations which seem to be new aspects of Kabbalah, which is, a, which is a novel idea that there could be something new in the Torah, but he seems to have had new revelations. And then there's someone called uh, Rabbi Yitzhak Luria, or we call him Ari, who lived in, uh, first in Egypt and then in Safed in northern Israel 450 years ago, and he had new revelations. And, but you have to remember in both cases, it wasn't, it's not so easy. Jews are very difficult people to, to they're not gullible people. Jews are, have, for every Jew, there's 10 questions. So every single thing, every single new revelation was, was tried and tested and, and, and accepted. And these people were, were, were checked until the, the Jewish people as a body, as one body, accepted these, these revelations as, as, uh, as truth. It wasn't so, it wasn't so easy. And especially the revelations of 450 years ago were quite, uh, quite uh, complicated. But at the end of the day, they're not really revelations. The revelations of new, they're wider, it's a wider aspects of the, of the, of the revelations of, of 2,000 years ago, of the Tsar. But uh, again, it's not, it's a question everybody asks all over the world, people want to know about it. It's not, there's no quick fixes, and there's no elixirs here. 
and no one's going to put a spell and, and, and have, the, have their enemy disappear, and no one's suddenly going to find their, their mate of their life, and none of this stuff. It's all, it's not, uh, it's not what it's about. But it is something like a, call it that, something like a different, an added, a more complicated, another, another language of software to add on to what we have. Software is very big data. <laughs> not so easy. I'm a rabbi, and that's the question I have to answer to the best of my knowledge. Is that, uh, do we wrap it up? Okay. I think we have any questions. Can I ask one question? Oh, sure, sure. So, uh, for me or for uh, After two weeks, uh, we will celebrate uh, Jewish New Year, is, if I am correct, yes? So, in the year of uh, Rosh Hashanah, in the synagogue, we, we can uh, hear readings uh, from Mincha, and I want to, uh, to cite uh, one part, uh, but only I have in Russian language, and I uh, want to ask you. Maybe it means in Kippur, there's no, there's no reading of Mincha. Наш дух восхваляет тебя, владыку всего мира, провозглашать величие создателя вселенной, который не сделал нас подобным другим народам мира и не дал нам быть похожим на все племена земные и не дал нам тот же удел, что и им ибо они поклоняются в пустоте и щете мы же преклоняем колено и возносим благодарность владыке царю царей святому I want to ask uh, what is your opinion uh, what education from this part uh, to relations between different uh, nations then they, they say that uh, <laughs> Uh, actually, okay, I'm actually in English, okay? Mm -hmm. um, it's too complicated to answer for me. In Ukrainian, I would like to, but maybe in a few weeks we can stay, we can stay here. So, uh, actually, this prayer is, uh, we say it three times every day. Not only in Rosh Hashanah and Kippur. You're right that in Rosh Hashanah and Kippur we say it inside the main prayer in the middle. But in the end of every prayer, uh, three prayers uh, during the every day, we, we do say. Now uh, I say I tell you even more. This this sentence that you that you noticed, uh, some of Jewish communities uh, sometimes erased it from the from the prayer. The sentence. The, self, sentence, self the sentence. sentence. Because there were afraid that the other, uh, other nations wouldn't understand it and it would be a danger. Mm -hmm. But hopefully, uh, luckily we are independent today and we are free, it's a free world, and uh, they, they, we do say the same. But what is the meaning? First of all, uh, this uh, prayer was written by whom? By Yoshua Brunon, the prophet which entered all the Jewish people, Israeli people to Eretz Israel. And he was the leader after Moses, after Moshe Rabbeinu. Uh, and uh, in those times, let's, let's start from those times. In those times, all the, all the people, especially in the land of Israel, or land of Canaan, those times, they, are, uh, they uh, worship to idols. Right? And the, the main purpose of the Israel people was to destroy all the idols in uh, Earth Israel and to, to uh, keep the real faith, which is monotheistic, uh, in uh, the uh, Holy Land, and then to teach other people, step by step, to accept the principles of the monotheism. But still, till today, we know that the the idol worship, idol worship in the, in the, all over the world has 
different characters. You know, it, 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 it sh the person shouldn't <coughs> worship a, a statue that he has in the corner of his house. Even when a person thinks that there are few forces in this world and the evil is independent and the good is independent, and the evils can act as, as, as it wants without, without being a, just part of the, the, the kingdom of the Creator, it's also idol worship. It's more, more delicate, but it's idol worship. So um, what we say in, the prayer is, in this prayer is that by now, until ah, by the way, you should read further and see what the ideal is. That all nations will accept that the Creator is the honest and He is one. And He is the, the, the God of all the, all the world, all over the world, all the nations, all the humanity, all that was created. And, and the, when all the humanity will accept it, this will be an totally under le uh, another level, another level of, uh, of the life of humanity. The moral, the, the, the moral, the real, real moral values will be all over the world in all humanity. No wars, no, no, no cruel, cruelty. I mean, it, it will be, and we are going there, we, we go step by step to that time. <coughs> now, if, Humanity is separated, if it is not, not united, mm -hmm. according to those principles that are written in this prayer. So, humanity has no hope. I mean, people will proceed to, to fight uh, each other and to make uh, very cruel things to each other with no morality, with no, with no purpose in their life. It's very sad. Now, in this prayer, why do we say it every day in the end of the prayer? Because after we pray for ourselves and for Jewish people and for, for, for the land of Israel and for many, many, many very good things. We pray for all, for all the world, over the world. And Rosh Hashanah, actually, the new year, is the, the most universal holiday in our tradition. Because we, all the prayers are, we are asking the, the Creator, the God, to be the king of all the humanity, not, not only ours. All the humanity, all, the, all over the world. This is the main, the main. Uh, it's, it's the main concept of the of the of the Rosh Hashanah prayer. That's the that's the main uh, the central theme. That's what you wanted. It's the central theme of the Rosh Hashanah prayer. Rule uh, your dominion should should be established over the entire world. So th th this is the purpose of this. Now, all of us, we agree that the situation today, the, the moral situation of, the, of the, the humanity is not ideal, right? We agree about that. The question is, what is the way to make it better? To make it better. So the Jewish people, when the, the people of Israel brought the, the Torah, the word of God, to this world, 3,338 years ago. This was the purpose. This was the purpose. Because we believe in humanity. We believe in God, of course, but we believe that if God created the humanity, humanity all over the world, in Africa, in Asia, in Europe, so every person and every nation has its own task, its own, its own uh, obligations, its own uh, character. It's like a, 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 an organism of, of, of a person. There are hands, there is a heart, there are legs, there are everything. It's every nation, every, every person has its own character, which is natural for, it, for him. When, when the, the, the illness comes, when the hand is, try, is, is trying to be a leg or a, a heart. It, it, it can function not as a heart and not as a hand. 
So as a, as a, as a Verizon becomes ill, becomes sick. What we want is to uh, return this world or to de develop this world to be a healthy world as the Creator made it and wants it to be. So this is the meaning of this prayer, or my opinion, right? what, what, what I studied from my... Uh, so, um, maybe up to you. If there, there are any questions about... I have one more stupid question. Yes. No question, question is stupid. We have in, in, in our yeah. tradition, no question is stupid. Okay. There is no such a thing. Uh, what are the explanations? Okay. Uh, Israel people are following mm -hmm. their traditions, yes, mm -hmm. uh, living all around the world, even as you said during the Soviet times, mm -hmm. survived all the mm -hmm. let's say national traditions. Mm -hmm. Why not survive? The only thing that not survived when they spread all around the Europe the language. So how Yiddish language arrives from nothing mm -hmm. when there is Hebrew language? I cannot, you know, you know, I, you know we are big fans of the I, I, I Israel have, history. That's why we're asking so I, many stupid questions. I could answer you a regular answer, which is right, I think, that, uh, that uh, Yiddish is not in the original Jewish language. Mm -hmm. This is the, the, the basic answer, which I quite believe in. But <coughs> he's asking why he didn't survive. Yeah, no, he's <coughs> asking why he did not no, survive. No, right? He's asking about Yiddish, not about why, why Yiddish. Yiddish. Yiddish was created that's that's but let's say no what's wrong you saying why did they stick to hebrew that's it is that no 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 no, no. Oh. why 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 the uh, jewish people living all around the europe started somehow to speak another language no, 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 no. Okay, so that, there were few jewish languages around the world yeah, there was ladino, awesome. ladino in spain which is was partly hebrew partly spanish uh -huh. and oh, also okay. there is a bukharian uh, jewish language in uzbekistan and there's a Persian Jewish language and Yemenite Jewish language which ah, is connected to Arab. Okay. Uh, and an Ethiopian Jewish language. Uh, yeah. Arabic. Why? Why? Because, because the main main uh, uh, main element of Jewish culture during the ages was the learning. Now, learning be, be, begins from age of three years old. Yeah, yeah. Two hundred and twenty. Now people, even if they didn't speak in Hebrew, they didn't know Hebrew, they started to learn. And, they, and, and learning in the Jewish tradition is not, not uh, individual. It has to be in a group with uh, at least two people that teach it each other, even if they are kids, children. So everyone spoke in the same language that they were used to, but during the, the learning, during the years, they accepted into their regular, regular, regular uh, language uh, a Hebrew terminology, which was not understood by, by others. Today, in America, people, people speak, it's a very interesting uh, thing, that now we see, we see it, people that learn Torah, they speak English very fluently, Rabbi Baron, but they take Hebrew words inside, and many, many times I'm Americans sure Amer Americans wouldn't understand what Rabbi Baron speaks to his friend when they are learning, even if they are learning English. Because there are some te te terminology that is not unknown to other people. So this, I think that this is the, the way that Yiddish and Ladino and other languages were developed. Because now, the text that you're saying, because the original texts are, are, in, are in Hebrew and Aramaic. That's right. Now, and uh, ah. Uh, someone told, told me a story uh, recently. Uh, an old man came to, to Israel from maybe from Ukraine, from Belarus. He didn't know Hebrew at all. And probably he is what even was very educated, but, but he had to, to make a living. So he went to, to work in a store to, to get some money to, to live. So and he didn't know Hebrew at all, so how did he go to contact with people in English? So once someone asked him, for how long is this cheese in the, in the refrigerator? So he said, I don't know who, who understands Yiddish here. He said, 
zwei Mäßle ist ihm. Das ist ihm nicht. Zwei ist du, okay, in Englisch. Aber was Mäßle ist ihm? Drei, ask a German person, was Mäßle ist ihm? You would know. Because Mäßle ist ihm, it's a terminology of the Talmud. This, this guy didn't open a Talmud at all. No, he doesn't understand how to read it. But he knows what's my slaves. My slaves is 24 hours. Okay, in, in, the, in our tradition. It's, 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 it's more, rather, if you say 24 hours, it's more detailed. It's a, it's a 24 hour period. That's to be precise. Period, that's right. a Talmud, it's a 24 hour period. Any 24 hour period. Yeah. So, 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 so that's what he was used from his maybe grandfather who talked Yiddish, who didn't know how to learn. Uh, Jewish, uh, Jewish uh, learnings and, and, and uh, but this phraseology is used in Yiddish or not? So yeah, those it, 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 who originally know Yiddish, it is used. It is yeah. used. Huh? What? It's used in Hebrew because it comes from the Talmud, but it's not in it's not in it's not in Yiddish. It's not in Yiddish. No, it's Yiddish. Not even also and also the way of saying. But this guy didn't know it's not in Yiddish. He didn't know. He thought it's a word in Yiddish. Ah, okay. You understand? So this has the, the roots and and. By the way, in this library, you can find many books, I, I suppose, so many books in Yiddish that were written by, by, uh, by writers the who back, were, yeah. some of them were unreligious at all, even atheistic. And they thought, as my great-grandfather thought, here in Vilna, in Vilnius, that there should be a Jewish culture in Yiddish, which is not necessarily connected to religion. Okay? Now, a hundred years fast, what do you see? You see that Yiddish remained only, only in a very religious communities. Because religious communities are built this way that they keep every detail that they got from their, uh, from the old generations, they don't want to lose it. Mm. Now, the, the non-religious uh, uh, people, even if they're non-Jewish, they usually make revolutions and they uh, deny everything they got and they are looking for something new. Okay, but, but, but uh, in Jewish people, they, all our tradition is built that we accept what we got from the, the old generations and we proceed it, maybe in a new way, maybe in, a, in some, some way that we understand it better, but what we got is a treasure and we keep it. Is any historical investigation when the Yiddish language started? Right. A lot, a lot of probably probably Middle Ages, I think. Middle yeah. Ages. There's a lot, a lot of the research that I've done. You know, it's such years. a difficult subject here in Vilna. A hundred years ago, there was a war here over the schools whether they should teach in Yiddish or in Hebrew. Of course. An absolute war I here in Vilna. In Kona, too. Yeah, I mean, I'm saying this. Uh, yeah. And in other towns. Here. In Lithuania. Yeah. Yeah. Only Lithuania. This was a Lithuanian war. In My great grandfather was a Yiddishist. Yeah. Maybe in Poland also. Yeah. Here, here it was much, much more. Much more. Maybe. Here, don't forget that here, a hundred years ago, the Jews had their own independent schooling system, the most advanced in the whole Europe. Under the free Lithuania. Under the free Lithuania. Yeah, I'm saying the Jews were allowed autonomy in their school system, and there was a massive battle in the early twenties over over the school system, over whether to 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 make the schools and in. in, in and the political lines in politics were around along this along the, the language lines, whether Yiddish or uh, yeah, I, I, yeah. I can tell you what the I, I speak Yiddish in my home. I speak a Lithuanian Yiddish. Not what he was talking about. Most people speak Yiddish today are only Hasidic who continue the the language and the thing. But I speak a Lithuanian Yiddish in my home. My father was a Lithuanian. My mother spoke Yiddish in in, in the United States. She spoke Yiddish at home. And uh, when I come here. Or if I meet people that here, they're so happy to hear to hear a person, mm -hmm. uh, a modern person, speak Yiddish in the in the, in the dialect, mm -hmm. in the Lithuanian dialect. No, it's considered a rare. Right. It's considered a rare thing. I, I think I speak to Manuel Zinger. You know Manuel Zinger. <laughs> he loves speaking to me in Yiddish. I think that Lithuania was the only country in the middle of the 20th century where we officially have the minister for Jewish affairs. Yeah, yeah. There was the first. I think in Poland too. I think but, in Poland too. Oh, yeah. What does mean? Big independence. I, I studied big, oh, big independence, yeah. big, big independence. But it didn't work so well because uh, at the end, the end, we know the end of the story. So this experiment wasn't so successful. 
Well, what can I tell you? Yeah. Yeah. 90, 97% uh, Holocaust, so it wasn't such a great experiment as far as the, uh, the autonomy, the Jewish autonomy for, for in, the, in Lithuania. There is a question here, how thick are Zvitas between A and Guinness? So maybe I'll tell you a story, a short story about it, which happened recently in our world. That was my moment. So, so a, a guy that, that made Aliyah, he came to Israel from Ukraine, he got the citizenship because he was Jewish. He went back to Ukraine, he met a young woman, a girl, wanted to marry her, he married her in Ukraine and brought, brought her to Israel. Okay. A real story. Now, it, it happened about 25 years ago, so they have a daughter, this girl, their daughter serves, is serving in the army right now. Of course, not the woman and not the daughter are not recognized as Jewish by the law and by the, by the state. So they offered the girl in the army to try a conversion process to Judaism, if she wants. There is a possibility in, in the Israeli army to make such a thing, to make a con conversion to, the, to Judaism for those who choose to. Who choose it. Now, but this, the husband, the father of the girl, made a research and he came to us and told us that in the family of, this, of his wife, there was a story that her great great grandmother, I mean, five generations ago, five generations ago, she converted to Christianity. Her name was Rivka. She was Jewish, and in 1911 she converted to Christianity in order to get, to, to get married to a Christian Ukrainian guy in Ukraine. This is a story. No, you, are, you, you don't have to believe such a story, but that, that's what they told. Now, after that, he contacted to an archivist in Ukraine, and they responded that it's, it, it's, it's right. So we have registration of woman named like this, which converted to Christianity, was baptized, and she married someone, Nikolai, or, or whatever. And then they had a daughter, this daughter married Ukrainian, she, they had a daughter, she married Russian or Ukrainian, they had a daughter, etc. And this girl was, uh, was born. Now, it is very, very fantastic story, but it could happen. We just have to prove it. So, uh, there are a few steps. First, we say that, okay, we have those, uh, those papers that say that those registrations do exist, but we didn't see those registrations. So, we had a way, we found a way to, to get the real uh, photos uh, of the church books, archives, a hundred and more years ago where we see this process, I mean, the, the conversion to Christianity and the marriage of this woman and the birth of her daughter, daughter etc., etc. And also, all the documents further, the Soviet documents already, when we see that the chain is complete. Now, not all the documents we could find. So, uh, and of course, uh, Israeli, like every bureaucratic system, whenever a person has the Israeli citizenship, it's, it's, it's done. I mean, who would be interested to become a Jew if he's already an Israeli? Only in what is connected to the rabbinical things, the, the marriage, the religious, religious marriage, etc. And raising children as Jews, etc. So we suggested, and there is a way, I wouldn't, we have no, no time, it's another, another lecture to talk about it, but we suggested some kind of a DNA test to help this woman to prove whether, because the story was really fantastic. Now before I tell you what, was, what, uh, what happened with the DNA test, I will say what was our motivation to do it. I mean, she is not recognized as Jewish by, by anyone. She has all the civil rights in Israel, no problem with that. What is our motivation as, as a state, as a society, as, as a religious people, as rabbis, what is our motivation? Our motivation is very simple. We want all our people back to us. We want, in order to be chosen people, not chosen to, to have privileges, but, cho but chosen to, to have obligations, 
towards ourselves and towards all the humanity, we have to bring all the last Jews back. According to Jewish tradition, of course, those who were born to a Jewish mother, etc. So this is the motivation, and our Torah, our learning in Judaism, says that we should make many, many efforts to do it, as the rabbis in, in our, our history did in all the generations, to look for maybe there was a kidnapped uh, ch uh, young, young, young children that were hid, hid uh, somewhere or something. They looked for every, every and, and they spent a lot of money to get them back, if it was possible. Because every Jewish soul is something very, very uh, important, something very, very uh, valued for us, and we cannot give up. So finally, she did this test, DNA test. I will explain now what Lachain did. There are two kinds of DNA tests. However, she did it, and it showed that absolutely her maternal line is absolutely Jewish, no doubt about it, in that, in the research. So after we had all these uh, details, the, the documentation and the DNA test and the story, so we went to the to the court with uh, with the recommendation, with conclusions, and the Philippian court did sure and did approve her Jewishness. And of course, if she is Jewish, even after six generations, when no one in this family knew they're Jewish or wanted to be Jewish, but whenever she is Jewish, recognized as Jewish, of course her daughter is also Jewish. She doesn't, she doesn't uh, have to convert. And uh, this is an example. There are many, many examples like that. Different, but also uh, they have a lot, of, a lot in common that we really make many of efforts to, to, to help people with that. Of course, uh, I'll tell another story. This will, this will be the, the last, okay? If I may. Uh, but it's, it's, it, it, is, it was published, so you can find it on the internet, on YouTube, etc. There is one person whose name was, is, is alive, is about 78 years now, old, or maybe 80. His name was Rumuad Vashinkir. He was raised in Poland, and he became a priest, a Catholic uh, priest, okay? And, uh, and he served as a priest, but he was not, he said that when, when he was a boy, people felt that he's different, he looks different, etc. So he, he, he felt that something is hidden in his past that he doesn't know. So when he was four years old, before his mother passed, passed away, his Poland mother passed away, she told him that when he was a, a baby, they took him from a couple, from a Jewish couple in Svenchonis, that were mur mm -hmm. murdered. Mm -hmm. You know the story? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Famous story. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so, so here's, the man, man, here's the man that was involved in the story. <laughs> they were in the ghetto. Yeah. And, and they, were, they were murdered. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, and he was raised by the Pol Polish family in, in Poland. He didn't know anything about his past until his mother told him. So he started to research. It was a very, you know, touching and, and very complicated thing for, for him to be a Christian priest, to, to look for his Jewishness, etc. However, for many, many, many years, his research, and even he thought that he found who was the real family in Shemshanis. And he came to Israel and started to live in Israel, and finally they gave him his citizenship in Israel. But he didn't uh, register him as a Jew, because he had no proof, had no proof in the Ministry of Interior. They did give him his citizenship. He can be a citizen in Israel, so that. So finally, when he, was, when he was maybe 73, 75, he came to us. I told him, look, I believe the story is true, but you have to convince the state. Yeah? And the state is bureaucratic and bureaucratic system. So let's do this new thing, the DNA. Okay? So uh, he made it. And in this case, we also discovered that he, he spoke as a Jew. There's no, no doubt. I, I just say, how, how can you know? There is 
kind of a DNA that passes only through maternal line. Only the mother can give it to the, her children and not the father. Mm -hmm. And there are groups in, inside this DNA research, there are groups that are, are, a, a, are a defined as statistically as that they belong to two groups. Now, what can be said? Maybe some of you will say it. Ah, it's very simple. Because you start to, to research DNA, etc. Genetics. So I say like, like this. I say that, first of all, about this person. His name is Yakov Wexler, the guy. He's alive, thank God. And he works in Yad Vashem in uh, Jerusalem for many years as a specialist for, for Polish documents. Uh, why is not, on my opinion, why, why, is, not a, why is it not a racism? Because the regular racism in the humanity was to hurt you. I mean, to, to prove that you are less than others. In Judaism, such a thing that doesn't, doesn't exist. Okay? We do know that we are a family, we Jewish female, people, we are a family, a special family, we are connected much more among ourselves than with other people, but we treat the other people as part of our big organism. Okay? As, as, as we have responsibility for, for our, our nations and we expect finally the humanity to become united with uh, the chosen people, as you said, that will lead the moral values and teach all the humanity. Why? Not because we are better, because God gave us, gave us those values and told us to develop them and to give it to the humanity. This is our uh, obligation, mission. Uh, I hope I will more or less clear this evening. And I want to say thank you about this meeting. It was very thank exciting. you so much. Yeah. I think we have a book dedicated to Professor Lestet in, in your personal collection and we have to, to check it out, which is dedicated to her and written by, by that former priest uh, survivor. Mm -hmm. uh, there are few, but maybe it's the same, I don't know. Uh, I think a few, I, I know the only one. There was one who was Jewish for sure, who passed away and he was buried in Poland. Yeah, and and not another Catholic, uh, another Catholic, Catholic priest, priest, a different Catholic but, priest. But this I'm talking about is not a priest today. Okay, he returned to Judaism, of course. But but uh, he, he was not proved, proven as Jewish. And, and that, uh, that was the work to do. It's again, also that reminds me of the movie Ida, you know, Polish movie Ida, uh, who, about the Christian nun. Uh, who is uh, who found, who found out a, a Jewish survivor who or also given maybe to some money to buy her to mm -hmm. survive and she comes out into the world and finds a lover but then she decides to come back to the monastery mm -hmm. uh, and I think I heard of it mm -hmm. yeah that mm -hmm. movie also won some prize, some I, prize. Think it's, well, I think the life can be much more fantastic yeah. than the movies. <laughs> yes, for sure. sure. So I remain with, still with very many questions, but time, Good. time <laughs> is. <laughs> Don't we all? Time is, you know, has no pity on us, so we are up to finish. Thank you again. Thank you very much for joining us. It was a presentation. Sure. Uh, I want to introduce you to Shabmondi. Ah. And it's about the 